This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the uh, regular board meeting of the West Basin Municipal Water District. It is now one o'clock, two minutes after, and we will I I call this meeting to order because I gabbled. <laughs> so uh, we'll have uh, a roll call. Yes, President Williams. I'll begin with Director Alvarez. Here. Director Deere. Here. Director Gray. Here. Director Here. Houston. Here. President Williams. Here. We have a quorum. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, is my, is my sound on? My mic on? Oh, it is. Yes. So. I will now uh, ask you all to uh, join me in the pledge of the flag. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag Next, we go to item number four, which is uh, public comment. Uh, Mr. Collin. Yes, President Williams, we do have two requests for public comment today. Uh, the first one that we received uh, was from Mary Massoon from the Surfrider Foundation. Mary, are you with us? Mary? Then we'll fall to our second request for public comment. And we did receive a request just moments ago from uh, Patricia McPherson from the Grassroots Coalition. Hello? Are you waiting for me to go ahead? Yes. Hi, this is Patricia McPherson. I'm president of Grassroots Coalition. Um, I uh, sent a letter in today that uh, we look forward to the board's response. Um, Dr. Margot Griswold and myself had given a presentation on July 20th, 2021 for you regarding the Biona Wetlands Ecological Reserve and uh, showing our concerns for it. And we had asked then for if we could provide a uh, request and Chair Gray had asked for a letter, a written ask, which we then provided. Um, I've included it in the lender, letter that I sent you today, um, as well as the request for an update. I also wanted to bring your attention to a couple of different things. With Biona Wetlands, um, we were recently in a meeting with the California Department of, uh, or the Fish and Game Commission, wherein Director Bonham stated to the commissioners that the West Basin Municipal Water District's board members had concluded that the restoration of Biona, the CDFW plan for digging out over 3 million cubic yards of soil, would not affect the deeper potable water supply of the West Basin. Um, I'm not aware of any comment that the West Basin folks have made, so we're looking to see this uh, uh, comment addressed. Um, I am not, a, well, I'm certainly aware that in the final environmental impact report for CDFW, there is no such study regarding what the uh, removal of all the soils uh, will do to the Biona area. And we have multiple overlying aquifers as well. Biona has been now acknowledged as a groundwater dependent ecosystem. So we have been working at getting the water restored to Biona, the fresh water, which it has an abundant amount of fresh water that is at or near the surface that we would like to see protected. Am I about out of time here or? You have about one more minute. All right, thank you. Um, 
To that end, um, just to let you know also, with the Water Board, who it has the oversight for the decontamination of the Howard Hughes site, and also NPDES for water that is pumped for the gas mitigation systems, we had recently asked for the Water Board to discontinue allowing the water to be sent to the Department of Sanitation, which they agreed with because it's a waste of water. And so that particular NPDES permit is now being restored to Biona. And we are working on getting all of the different NPDES permits uh, for drainage of Biona's waters to restore Biona. Um, and uh, with that, I just wanted to remind you that I sent you a letter today which has the attachments. And uh, we look forward to a response from you on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. And President Williams, if I could uh, just yes. add one thing. Uh, we did receive the email from uh, Ms. McPherson today. Uh, I am actually pulling some information related to a letter that uh, West Basin Municipal Water District's Board of Directors had authorized because I, I thought a comparison uh, or a review of what the letter that we sent and the letter that uh, she's provided us. And we will get that out to the full board today. Okay, thank you. Terrific. Thank, thank you. you. And I do believe. Happy uh, night. I don't know how to sign up for the uh, public comment. Uh, is this Mary? No, Kathy. No, this is Kathy Knight, and I, I, I can't. I don't understand how to sign up for the public comment. But I wanted to make a public comment. No worries, Kathy. We'll add you to the queue. Uh, you'll be next. And I okay. believe that Mary Simoon did join us from Surfrider Foundation. Good afternoon, everyone at West Basin. Thank you so much for having me. Again, I'm with Surfrider Foundation. I run the Teach and Test program and the Waste Characterization programs. And I just wanted to say with all my heart, thank you so much for your support. Not just the funding that's important, but you give field trips to our students. You provide them with educational resources, information on career pathways. And there are a whole bunch of educational resources I just learned about recently from Janelle that I have yet to tap into, but I'm going to. And I just can't thank you enough. We started up again this year. This was our second sampling yesterday. And the students are super excited. We have students who started in the seventh grade and they're now in the 10th grade and they're still with us. We have students who are new this year. Parents are excited, teachers are excited. Random people walk through Dive and Surf to shop there and they ask us what we're doing. And I had a woman yesterday, she's so excited about our program. She wants to get her 12 year old involved who's at Adams Middle School, that just I have anecdotes that would just blow your mind I and mean, just bring me to tears. It makes me happy. And I, I feel free to ask me any questions. But the last thing I wanted to say is we're, we're working hard to get more schools involved. Um, we have Lawndale still on board and they are rock stars. But I have two new teachers at Lawndale who are interested. One of them is going to start out with our waste characterization study. And then I'm also working with another losing her high school a teacher there who's going to start out with waste characterization as well and i'm hoping at some point we'll be able to expand all the way down to san pedro so i i just can't thank you enough and feel free to ask me any questions and thank you for giving me your time thank you thank you very much mary and we do have one last request for public comment and that's from kathy knight Yes, um, good morning. My name is Kathy Knight. I'm with, on the board of the Biona Ecosystem Education Project. And I just want to uh, tell you that we strongly support um, the comments of Grassroots Coalition and Patricia McPherson about protecting the fresh water sources at the Biona wetlands. Um, it's very important, not only for our future with a huge drought coming on or going on right now, um, to protect our drinking water aquifers, but it's also important for the wildlife out there to have fresh water. So um, we asked, I mean, they're, they're, we're being asked to cut back majorly on water and by the governor and um, we, um, the farmers are asking to cut back on growing food. So it's just, it's just a huge, huge issue. And um, I would really, we would really, really, um, appreciate your support um, to follow through on the ask of um, Grassroots Coalition and write a letter um, to uh, support pr protecting the freshwater biona. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. And President Williams, we did receive an additional request for Mr. Craig Cudwallader from Surfrider Foundation. Is he on the line? He is. Okay, go ahead. Craig, go ahead. 
Hello, thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up on Mary Simon's comments about how grateful we are for West Bates in support of the teaching test program. I am continually surprised by the sophistication of the students who participate. And um, I think it's a tremendous learning opportunity that um, is enabled by your partnership with the Surfrider Foundation South Bay chapter. And we are sincerely grateful. And um, I just know that uh, the more students we get, the better it is. And it's so um, encouraging to me to see how intelligent and how passionate they are about clean water. And you're helping us get that message out. So I wanted to support what Mary said and also express my thanks again. I know I tried to do it at the public information committee meeting, but was having audio problems. And thank you, uh, Mr. General Manager, for reading my text message. But we are very grateful for the support and partnership with Wes Basin. Thank you very much. That's all I have. That concludes our public comment. Okay, very good. Then that takes us to item number five, presentations. President Adams, we do not have any presentations. Okay, how about uh, number six? <clears throat> Items to uh, late to the uh, agenda. We have no items that are too late to be agendized. Then that moves us to item number seven, consent calendar. Mr. Chairman, I'll move the adoption of the consent calendar in its entirety. In its entirety. Well, I would I apologize. I would like to uh, pull items 7B and 7C, and I'll be abstaining on 7G. Okay. I'll, I'll rescind my amendment and, and make an, uh, my uh, motion to make an amendment to uh, approve just the balance of the consent calendar. The balance of the consent calendar. You, you have those uh, items to be pulled. Which, which one did you, did you pull? We have items 7B and 7C. Anyone do what else, what else you wanted to do? Abstain on. Okay. So I'm, I'll move item 7A, D, E, F, G, and H. Okay. Very good. So we, uh, we vote first. A second. Is there a second? I'll second that. Seven G. Seven G. I am a, I am a Saini. Uh I don't want to cast the vote on the other. Yet? That was item G, right? 7G? 7G. Extension. Okay. okay. And President Williams, are we a roll call vote? Yes. And Director Alvarez? Yes. With an abstention, mm -hmm. abstaining on item G? Director Deer? Yes. Director Gray? Can you tell me what item G? This is for the approval of the consent calendar uh, with the remaining items. Both items 7B and 7C have been pulled. Okay. So this Thank will be you. items E, D, E, F, G, and H. All right. Thank you. I, my vote is yes. Thank you. Thank you. Director Houston? Yes. And President Williams? Yes. Then we'll take the other items. Correct. The, the first item uh, that's been pulled is uh, item number 7B. It's an agreement award for supply and delivery of anti scaling chemicals. Uh, this item was uh, uh, provided by Susanna Lee, our Senior Operations Engineer at the Engineering and Operations Committee. Uh, and I believe uh, she is available uh, in the meeting here today to answer any questions. Okay. I I don't need a presentation. I do have a question. Um, with respect to the item, um, <clears throat> and we can talk about this at the Committee on the Fiscal Impact, and I <clears throat> appreciate that it's in the Recycled Water Operations uh, Budget 
um, which has $10,607,000. Now, the way the recommendation is phrased, it basically is authorizing an agreement, or at least the way I see it, and so this is where I would like some clarification, an agreement uh, for purchasing the anti-scaling uh, chemicals at a price of a dollar to a pound. Is there a not to exceed number on this? Up <clears throat> Earlier in the staff report, it does say the uh, $130,000, but I do not see a not to exceed number in the recommendation. I do see Mark and Ms. Sirlin, our uh, Executive Manager of Engineering Operations. Yes, uh, thank you, EJ, and uh, good afternoon, uh, President Williams and board members. Um, yes, it's true that the recommendation is not included, not to exceed for the chemicals. Uh, in the past, um, when we did use a not, ex not to exceed on the particular chemicals, we've run into situations where um, uh, where we had to rush back to get an approval for an extension uh, when, for one reason or another, we're using more than um, more chemicals than we should be, uh, whether it's related to an upset at the Hyperion plant or, um, or for, for another reason. And so for certain chemicals where We've uh, seen these issues. Uh, we uh, recommend not using the verbiage for not to exceed uh, in the recommendation itself, allowing us to use a particular chemical until uh, until the the term of the agreement is concluded. Okay, so what's the term of this agreement? The term of this agreement uh, runs through the proposed one for 7B, item 7B, runs through December 31st, 2024. So uh, if we were to, uh, we would basically lock in this rate uh, up to that point. If for some reason or another, the amount of chemicals that we used is higher, uh, and we're running close. If we had a not to exceed, for example, we would run close to the budget because we use more chemicals. Uh, then that gives the opportunity for the vendor uh, before the term ends to uh, increase the dollar amount of the chemical because we would have to do an amendment. Okay, so what's the term of this agreement? putting forth um i guess i would feel more comfortable with an upper limit um the anticipated uh, expenses have been one hundred thirty thousand dollars a year then for a four year be 390 you can maybe say that uh, you would like authorization in an amount of four hundred and fifty thousand or five hundred thousand with an explanation of the delta uh, between uh, the anticipated amount if everything went fine and the amount that it may be exceeded. Um, but from a, just from personally looking at the budget, I'd like to know how much money we're committing to funding these activities. Um, and then I do have a second question. The second question has to do with a kind of uh, multi-year uh, explanation that's provided under fiscal impact that says that even though this is funded in the current budget uh it will be budgeted in fiscal years 22 23 23 24. Uh, so we're only funding part of the amount that we're committing to purchase this year and then funding then then another portion next year and another portion the year after that is that the way that's in intended to be read The way it's intended to be read is that we're proposing a contract that with a vendor that goes beyond the current fiscal year. And so uh, because of that, we are obliged to say that we not only have the, the funds for this chemical, this essential chemical, this fiscal year, 
but we will need to uh, budget for it in uh, next fiscal year because the term extends through the next fiscal year. President Williams, if, if, we, if I may, President Williams, yes. if, if, if we're going to get into a discussion or deliberation on this item, I, I would recommend that a motion is made and seconded so we can, um, once we get past the point of asking questions. Uh, I'll, I'll move approval of the uh, We have a uh, motion to approve the item. Is there a second? I'll second it. Second, second to. Yeah, now you can have the discussion. To, uh, Approved item. So now we get into a full discussion on the item. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm pretty much uh, at the end of uh, I think my comments. Um, I I guess that, and I've made this comments before. I feel more comfortable when we enter into these multi-year contracts that um, we budget at them at the time that we enter the new contract, and we know how much we're committed to doing uh, or, or committed to funding over the next three years and uh, budget for that accordingly as opposed to leave it open-ended. Um, just not comfortable with that open-ended approach. Uh, I don't think it uh, provides sufficient financial controls to really understand where the money's going uh, at the time that one's looking at a budget. Um, and that's been a concern I've expressed in the past and I continue to express it and I'm not comfortable with funding uh, expenditures in that way. Okay. Yep. That's all my comments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Caldwell. You look like you had a comment. Well, I was I was gonna just mention that this is, has been historically uh, West Basin budgeting process. Uh, we enter into these agreements. In this case, uh, you're talking about chemicals and, and the costs that are going to occur, uh, basically. Uh, on a calendar basis for additional years. Uh, West Basin uh, budgets on a fiscal year basis, which is why there's three fiscal year budget budgets that would be impacted in order to to basically meet our requirements as part of the agreement. So this is historically uh, our common practice. All right, any more questions? Hearing none, no? I'm, I'm ready to call for the question. Director Alvarez. I'll be voting no just to express uh, my disagreement with our budgeting approach. Director Deer. I'll be voting yes to express my agreement with the motion. Director Gray. Yes. Director Houston. Yes. yes. President Williams. Yes. Okay, then moves us to the next item. Yes, President Williams, the next item that we have is item 7C. This is an award for chemistry analytical reporting and career services contract. Uh, this item was presented by Jamie Malpete, our water quality and environmental compliance supervisor at our engineering and operations committee. We have both uh, Mark and Ms. Turlian, our engineering uh, executive manager of engineering operations, as well as Uzi Daniel, our manager of operations here. Uh, if the board has any questions. You want to make a motion first on this item? I have one question. I'll move the motion. We move by Director Deer to approve the item. Is there a second? I'll second. second by Director Gray. Okay, uh, similar question with respect to the uh, budgetary implications. Uh, <clears throat> the total amount being requested uh, under this item for the two contracts is uh, $700,000, $700,243.50. The budget uh, has $704,290 in it for fiscal year 21-22 for laboratory services. So there's sufficient money in this year's budget to cover the three years. Uh, again, then I question why in the uh, fiscal impact uh, <clears throat> explanation, we do have the similar language as the previous item that it will be budgeted through fiscal year 23-24. Um, I would again argue that uh, we have the money that's in the budget. It covers the uh, amount of both of these uh, agreements that are being recommended 
uh, for a ward, uh, and why are we not just budgeting that money right now and it, and it's tied up and we know that we've set aside the money to pay for these things. PJ, I can take that. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, Dr. Alvarez, yes, um, the $704,000 includes, not only includes the laboratory services that we contract out these um, third party laboratories um, as the you know the, the vendors that you see in the staff report but it also includes the cost of lab services at our um, Edward C. Little facility so it, it includes lab services that are provided by Suez staff um, in that facility so that's the seven hundred thousand dollars there uh, for this fiscal year and then uh, with regards to uh, budgeting in the next fiscal year, uh, am I hearing you say your suggestion is to not only budget for one fiscal year, but budget for multiple fiscal years? So when we are giving contracts uh, that are that go beyond one fiscal year, that they are accounted for. That's a question. That was a question. For I didn't follow you at the end. Am I, am I understanding you correctly, uh, Director, that your suggestion is, is for us to budget for multiple years in order to account for contracts and dollar values that extend beyond one fiscal year? No, just the opposite. Even when we enter into multi-year contracts, I would prefer to have the money set aside so that I know that's in the budget. I've got $700,000. Uh, I've committed those $700,000 today. That money has now been reserved. It's accounted for, and it will be spent over the next three years. Um, as opposed to the approach that the district apparently has followed, uh, which is kind of an open-ended approach where uh, there's a big pot of money that's sitting there and then multiple expenditures are assigned for it. Every time uh, you read the fiscal impact, it says it's in the budget, but I never know what's in the budget because at some point, unless I go back and keep track of everything, when have I exceeded the pots that's in the budget? Um, I know that right now, when I look at the amount of these two contracts, it's $700,243. There are $704,000 that have been set aside in the budget. So I would like to see that appropriated and that money's appropriated for the next three years. Uh, and that would be, my motion, uh, but there's another motion on the table, and I, I, I don't think a substitute motion is going to carry at this point. Um, so I will just, from a point of view of being able to track expenses, understanding how much we're budgeting, understanding how much money is in the budget and what it's for, that it would be much better if we had a more detailed budget with line items and that when we commit to spending money that that money is identified in a line, line item and is appropriated and then that's set aside and we know what our financial commitments have been as opposed to leaving it open-ended and having to deal with the fact that we have to raise rates because we're a little bit uh, footloose and fancy free in how we're budgeting and accounting for budgets. That's it for my comments. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, so where are we? I lost track. You have a motion. Have a motion in a second. Is there, are there any more questions? Hearing none, I will call the question. Director Alvarez. No. Director Deer. Yes. Director Gray. Yes. Director Houston. Yes. President Williams. Yes. Okay, next item. Yes, President Williams. Uh, this brings us to our action calendar, item 8A, and this is a resolution number 10 21. 1141 for reauthorizing the Brown Act provisions and virtual meetings. 
And for this, we do have our legal counsel. This was an item that was originally brought before the board last month. And this would allow a West Basin Municipal Water District to continue to protect the safety and health of not only staff, the board, as well as members of the public by allowing uh, us to utilize virtual meetings. Thank you. President Williams, uh, board members, very briefly, um, this item um, is a reauthorization, as uh, General Manager stated, and um, it allows you to continue to meet in a virtual manner pursuant to the provisions of the Brown Act, the new provisions. So passing this item will extend that ability to meet virtually for another 30 days. We will bring this item to you on monthly basis, once a month, uh, probably in a in a consent uh, format if uh, if the board decides to move this item forward today. Uh, and then you will have the choice to either reauthorize it or not every 30 days. And you have the ability to do that based upon the continued state of emergency that is declared by the state of California, as well as the ongoing uh, recommendation by the LA County Health Department for uh, distancing and for masking. I'll answer any questions you may have. Okay, what are the wishes of the board? I move we approve it. Been moved that we approve the resolution number, resolution number? 1021-1141. In the title again? In the title again? A resolution of the Board of Directors of the West Basin Municipal Water District proclaiming a local emergency persists, re-ratifying the proclamation of a state of emergency by Governor Newsom, and reauthorizing remote teleconference meeting and for, of the board for the next meetings. Is there a second? This is Houston. I will second that. Okay. We moved and seconded. Roll call. Director Alvarez. Here. Director Deer? Yes. Director Gray? Yes. Director Houston? Yes. President Williams? Yes. Okay. President Williams, the, the next item that we have for you is uh, item number 8B under your action counter. It is for a fiscal year 2021-2022 district sponsorship request. Uh, as noted in the uh, board memo. Uh, back in July, uh, West Basin's Board of Directors did consider a whole host of uh, potential uh, sponsorships for industry leading organizations. At that time, it was uh, brought by the or directed by the board to bring back individual sponsorships for consideration. We did receive one from the Southwest Membrane Operators Association, or SAMOA, for their 2021 annual conference. As such, staff did pre present the memo uh, and the information related. Uh, this item was reviewed by the Finance and Administration Committee on Wednesday, October 20th, 2021, uh, and was forwarded to the board without a recommendation. Uh, just a reminder of the conversation that we did have, uh, the, the committee did request information related to our past sponsorship of the event. So it is included in the board memo that we did not sponsor this event in 2020 as it was canceled. And secondly, in the past, West Basin Municipal Water District has provided a platinum sponsorship in the amount of $2,500. The recommendation is that the board consider sponsoring the Southwest Membrane Operators Association 2021 annual conference to be held on Tuesday, November 2nd, 2021 through Thursday, November 4th, 2021 and determine the level of sponsorship participation. Uh, information related to the levels of sponsorship are included uh, as exhibits to the uh, board memo. And I did want to just point this out. The staff does not have a specific recommendation as to uh, uh, the level of sponsorship or whether the board should sponsor it, uh, but staff's recommendation is that the board consider. What was the, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, go ahead. What was the motion that the, was originally made at the finance committee that was withdrawn for how much it was the same recommendation uh that was is included in this board packet uh, but of course the no, no, i know i know yes. you're i'm talking about what the finance committee discussed it and we made a motion which we didn't fall through on what was that motion 
the motion was to direct this to the full board for consideration, uh, no but, amount, but no recommendation as to the item. But there is some history of, of the past. Mm -hmm. and, then, and that amount is for 2,500? It's as high as $2,500. If you look in the board memo, you can do, they have a bronze sponsorship of $500. And then that goes all the way up to a platinum of two two thousand, and then a welcome networking reception of twenty five hundred dollars. So what we're looking for here is the wishes of the board, because at the uh, committee level, uh, there were not um, well, there's only two of uh, two members there, so we didn't make a a, a, a motion, but we rather sent it here to the full board. To have a look at it and, and maybe maybe come out with a with a motion here. Okay, just for um, Director, the, I, I do have a question. Uh, if I, for clarifications on the budget, uh, <clears throat> when we talked about uh, um, but our uh, contributing to associations and those types of things, we decided to take all of that money and put it into uh, the drop program, um, specifically to allocate it for disadvantaged communities. Um, so if my understanding is correct, there is no money in the budget for this at this point, because that money was all transferred to a different uh, appropriation, if I could use that terminology, even though we, we don't technically use it. Um, if we move forward with funding this at any level, where would that money come from? Because it says here that the money will come from the sponsorship budget, but the sponsorship budget was eliminated uh, by the board. It is staff's recommend or staff's understanding that what the board agreed to do was uh, remove four annual memberships. Uh, in terms of the specific discussion related to sponsorships, uh, that item was not approved to to take that budget and dedicate it to the drought uh, program. The the sponsorship program, as was identified, I think it was the the second page of the materials that that were provided. Uh, it was directed to staff to bring that back for individual consideration. So in that sense, we we did take the membership funds and dedicated that to a conservation program. But as far as the individual sponsorship programs, it, they're still budgeted for, uh, the money has not been spent, uh, and, but we are bringing each individual item back for consideration. Okay, well, <clears throat> we'll see how this goes, but I will make a motion not to sponsor this uh, particular request. Okay, it's been moved that the uh, uh, motion to uh, sponsor this event is no. Is there a second? Hearing none, this motion dies for lack of a second. So I'll entertain another motion. Dr. Deere? No. Dr. Houston, is that? Do I hear you? I was going to actually, yeah, I was going to ask a question real fast, if I could. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Yeah. Who uh, who goes to this conference? Is this our staff members who attend? In the past, uh, we have had staff participate. It's my understanding that it was, uh, the plans to participate this year, and I do not believe that any of the directors are uh, planning to to attend as well. Okay, I'm sorry. You cut out. You cut out EJ when you said who was attending. Oh, I apologize. Uh, it's my understanding that we do not have any staff or directors looking to participate in this event uh, this year. In the past, we have had uh, staff participate, and I know that we did have a staff member uh, who's no longer with the district that's been uh, very active. Okay. Um. Eric, yeah, I, um, you know, I, I really, at this point, I'm not inclined to sponsor, so, um, 
I would, I know Director uh, Alvarez made that motion a few moments ago. I, you know, if he wants to make it again, I'll second it. Well, I, I do have some questions when Director Houston finishes. Hello. Hello. The question, Hello. question from Director Houston. Well, I'm I'm done asking questions. Yeah, thank you. All right, Director Gray. Yes, and EJ, you did cut out. I can't hear you. You're very staticky. Maybe it's your mask on. I don't know, but I didn't really hear your response. Do we have who attended the conference? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Four board members. That yeah. Attend. Something's wrong with your mic, EJ. Something's wrong with your mic. I apologize, Dr. Can you hear me okay? No, it's still static. It's still bringing up. Randy, I'm on a Zoom call. Can I call you right back? Okay. Hold on a second. We'll see what we can do here. Thank you. Can you? Hello? Yes, can you hear me? That's better. Yes, who attended from staff? I do not believe we have anybody registered to attend this year's conference. We do have some operations staff that the event would provide uh, uh, some benefits to, uh, specifically in our operations department. Okay, you're still staticky, but uh, I know that you did not make a recommendation. You just said consideration. So why are you asking us to consider it? Is it just because the request came in? But what's your perspective on it? To some degree, I think this, staff, go on. I think typically, if we if we have staff uh, able to be there and and generate some of the publicity for West Bay's municipal water districts programs and our efforts, I do find that there's opportunities for West Basin to promote itself within the industry. Uh, again, here the the costs are nominal, and because we have sponsored this in the past. Uh, and it's included in the board memo that in past years, West Basin has been a platinum sponsor uh, of the event in the amount of $2,500. That is why we received the request. Yes. Does the bronze sponsorship, the lowest, does that allow your staff to go and present? Uh, we can we can always uh, attend and present. We could pay individually to have staff members go. Uh, we do not have any papers submitted for this event. Uh, it is uh, scheduled to be held in November. Right, and and you said the budget is still there, and and the direction to you was to bring back individual requests. Correct. That's correct. Right. And, and the four organizations or whatever number of organizations were deleted and those amounts were deleted from the sponsorship budget, correct? No, I want to make that very clear. Uh, it, those were memberships. The memberships to certain organizations, we repurposed those dollars within the budget. The sponsorship, what the direction that we received from the board was to bring back individual sponsorship requests. Got it. Okay, got it. Well, I make a motion to to sponsor the bronze, the very lowest membership. Just, just a moment. There is a motion. The There's already a motion. Thank you, Brian. The motion was not to sponsor. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, I see. No, no amount was attached to it. I like it. I can't hear you guys. Five hundred dollars. And there's their second. Director Gray. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Would you support that? Did you hear that? I made a motion for five hundred dollars. I don't hear anything else about it. Okay. But, 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 director yeah. Deer, <laughs> director is making the motion. Would you second it? Well, I'm second it, then. I, I don't know where. Hey, can you hear me? 
This is uh, this is Martin Cusano. Director Gray, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Director Gray made a motion and amended it to include a five hundred dollars scholarship. I mean, a sponsorship. And you can second that motion if you desire, but you can't make another motion that's the same. No, I made the, the initial motion myself when I made my comments. You guys didn't hear me. I yes. made the motion for the $500 initially when I made my comments. Yeah, Director Gray, we heard you very well. Thank you. Director Deer made that motion before the discussion started. Oh, before the discussion started. I'm sorry. Then I second it. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you, Mark. Thank you I second Director Deer's motion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now the chair will call for the question. Director Alvarez. No. Director Deer. Yeah. Director Gray. Yes. Director Houston. No. President Williams. Yes. Okay. Next motion item. carries three to two, by the way. Pardon me? Motion carries three to three votes to I'm two. I'm sorry, motion carries three votes. Yes. Next item. Yes, President Williams. The next item that we have is agenda item number eight C. And this item is related to our CalPER statutory and regulatory requirements for publicly available pay schedules. Uh, this item was presented uh, at the or Finance and Administration Committee on Wednesday, October 20th, 2021. The item was presented by our Manager of Human Resources, Ms. Michelle Green. Uh, the item was heard by the committee and was directed to the full board without a recommendation. So, we... uh, I apologize for the technical difficulties on our end. Uh, the item that we have before you now is item 8C, a CalPERS statutory and regulatory requirements for publicly available pay schedules. Uh, this item was presented at the uh, Finance and Administration Committee on Wednesday, October 20th, 2021. Uh, the item was directed to the full board by that committee, but they did not make a recommendation. Uh, at that time, we did have our manager of human resources, Ms. <coughs> Michelle Green. Uh, do the presentation. She is available today for this item. Uh, and I'll take uh, hand it off to her. Thank you, EJ. Uh, good afternoon, President Williams and members of the board. Um, as EJ mentioned, this item is on the CalPERS statutory and regulatory requirements for publicly available pay schedules. As a reminder, West Basin contracts with the California Public Employees Retirement System, otherwise known as CalPERS, to provide pension benefits for its employees. CalPERS regularly sends out circular letters which give direction to a num all you know, public agencies that are uh, members of uh, CalPERS with regard to all matters regarding uh, salary, uh, compensation, retirement, and other things. So the CalPERS circular letter number 200-056-11 noted that all public agencies are required to have a publicly available pay schedule. In essence, this schedule must ensure consistency between CalPERS employers and enhance the disclosure and transparency of public employee compensation by requiring that the pay rate or item of special compensation be listed on a pay schedule or in a document meeting criteria set forth in their regulations. The Public Employees Retirement Law, Government Code Section 20626 and 20636.1 define compensation earnable for state, school, and public agency members. In essence, Section 20636D further requires that pay rate and special compensation schedules, ordinances, or similar documents be public records available for public scrutiny. California Code Regulations outlines, uh, regulation number 570.5 570 outlines the required elements necessary to meet the definition for a publicly available pay schedule. Those requirements are as follows. That pay schedule must have 
It must have been uh, duly approved and adopted by the employer's governing body in accordance with requirements of applicable public meeting laws. It must identify the position's title, position title for every employee position. Next page. It must show the pay rate for each identified position, which may be stated as a single amount or as, a, or as multiple amounts within a range. It must indicate the time based, including but not limited to whether the time base is hourly, daily, biweekly, bimonthly, or annually. It must be posted at the office of the employer or immediately accessible and available for public review from the employer during normal business hours or posted on the employer's internet website. It must indicate an effective date and date of any revisions and it must be retained by the employer and available for public inspection for not less than five years. And lastly, it does not reference any other document in lieu of disclosing the pay rate. All eight reg requirements must be met in one salary schedule for each member's pay in order for CalPERS to approve the pay amount as pay rate and reportable compensation earnable. West Basin's current salary schedule, which is attached um, as attachment A, I believe that is on packet page number 137. That uh, salary schedule was approved for the 2020-2021 fiscal year, but has been now updated in schedule B, I'm sorry, schedule attachment B, which is, now, which is reflected on packet page 138. And it has been updated to consider the 2020 Consumer Price Index for our general area, in addition to an increase of the salary grade ranges by 2% based on a survey of like agencies using their across the board average cost of living increases. The proposed schedule has also been updated to incorporate the Facilities Maintenance Coordinator classification as it was inadvertently not included in the last approved schedule. This classification was approved though in the 2020-2021 fiscal year budget for hiring on or after January 1, 2021. So that's likely as, as a result of one of the reasons why it was not included in the last salary schedule. Pursuant to the CalPERS regulations, the amended salary schedule must be posted on West Basin's website for public review, as I stated earlier. This practice is consistent the practice of amending salary schedules, I should say rather, is consistent with recommendations from our West Basin's last two classification and compensation studies by Ralph Anderson and Associates, in which uh, was indicated that in order to update or amend your salary schedule, or that you should annually look at your salary schedule and update it based on CPI and salary surveys of other like agencies. So that is consistent which, which is uh, with what is noted on uh, the amended salary schedule on packet page 138. The benefit to uh, this uh, to West Basin is as a CalPERS agency member, West Basin must be in compliance with its regulations in accordance with the California Code and the PEARL. Continued compliance promotes sound business practices in the administration of West Basin employee retiree, retiree benefits or retirement benefits. I, um, this concludes my report. Unless any of the directors have any questions, I can move forward to read the recommendation. Any questions? Or would you like to hear the recommendation? Let's hear the recommendation. The recommend, thank you, Director Deer. The recommendation is that the board approves the amended West Basin Municipal Water District salary schedule as noted in packet page 138. I'll make that motion. And Director Deer moves the motion, the recommendation, I'm sorry. Is there a second? Mr. Houston, I'll second. I didn't understand you. Houston, second. It was seconded by Director Houston. So it's been moved and seconded. Any, any further questions? If you're done, we can vote on this item now. All the questions, please. Director Alvarez. Yes. Director Deer. Yes. Director Gray. Yes. Director Houston. Yes. President Williams. Yes. The next item. Yes, President Williams. And uh, before I go into the next item, I did, we, we have been communicating with staff and folks that are, have joined us virtually. Uh, they have asked us if we could uh, speak more clearly into our microphones. I do recognize that it's a little bit difficult with our masks. 
Uh, but if uh, prior to speaking, if you could pull the microphone closer to you, uh, it might help you, uh, you know, throw, throw out your voice so, so they can hear us a little bit better online. Uh, the next item that we have is item 8D. And this is our Federal Legislative Advocacy Services. And I did want to point out uh, one thing. Uh, because of the date of our Water Policy and Legislation Committee meeting, we did host that uh, this past Friday. Uh, but because the meeting began at 2 p.m. and we did have a 1 p.m. deadline for uh, meeting the requirements under the Brown Act to post this meeting's agenda, uh, we did include the next two items within the action calendar rather than the consent. The reason for that was because we did not know how the committee would vote on the items. So we just included them here. Uh, the item that we have before you, uh, 8D, is uh, again for Federal Legislative Advocacy Services. Uh, at that committee meeting on Friday, uh, the Water Policy and Legislation Committee did approve option one, that the board authorized the general manager to enter into a new agreement with Mansquayak Associates Incorporated for Federal Legislative Advocacy Services for the 24-month period of January 1st, 2022 to December 31st, 2023 at a rate of $13,250 per month plus reasonable expenses not to exceed $16,000 for the 24-month period for a total not to exceed cost of $334,000. I'll, I'll move option one. The recommendation has been approved by Recommended by Director Deer. Is there a second? I'm second. Seconded by Director Gray. We have roll call, please. Director Alvarez. Yes. Director Deer. Yes. Director Gray. Yes. Director Houston. Yes. And President Williams. Yes. Okay, thank you. That item has been approved unanimously. All right, item number next. Yes, uh, item number 8E is uh, our state legislative advocacy services. Uh, similar to the previous item, this item was heard by the Water Policy and Legislation Committee uh, this past Friday. Uh, again, uh, due to the procedural process of meeting the Brown Act, we did throw it on the agenda, not knowing at the time what the com uh, committee would be doing. Uh, at that meeting, the Water Policy and Legislation Committee did approve adoption of option one that the board authorized the general manager to enter into a new agreement with Neomel Apophis and Associates for state legislative advocacy services for the 24 month period of January 1st, 2022 to December 31st, 2023 at a rate of $12,000 per month plus reasonable expenses, not to exceed 10% of the monthly rate for a total not to exceed contract amount of $316,800. I'll move approval of option one. It's been moved by Director Hill, second. to approve option one. And uh, I, did I hear Houston, Director Houston second that? That's correct. Okay. I have a question. Uh, I have a question. One, um, Director Alvarez. It, on your fiscal impact, it says that the funds for the this these services are included in the fiscal year budget. Where are they? Would you like me to answer that question? Yes, yes please. please. Yes. I don't have the budget in front of me. I apologize. Yeah, absolutely. So this particular one, it's included in our water policy budget, uh, um, specifically called water policy uh, and in, in the amount of uh, for one year's worth of contract. And Director Alvarez, uh, I know you weren't able to join us with the Water Policy and Legislation Committee. It is important to note that uh, when uh, West Basin Municipal Water District was entering into the budget process, uh, we did reach out to both our state and federal advocacy firms uh, to inquire whether they would continue uh, working for us at the same rate so we could budget properly. Uh, both firms agreed to do so at that time. And if I could just clarify specific to you, uh, Director Alvarez, in your question, uh, specifically, the line item is legislative advocacy. Um, the fiscal year 21-22 budget is $349,965 for fiscal year 21-22. Thanks. 
and that's for both federal and state. Correct, yes, both uh, federal and state are in included in that number. Anything else? Director Alvarez? No, that's it. Okay, any more questions? We have, there's, there's a motion that has been moved and seconded. I will call for the question. Director Alvarez. Yes. Director Deer. Yes. Director Gray. Yes. Director Houston. Yes. President Williams. Yes. Thank you. Next item is item number nine. Yes, thank you, President Williams. Uh, this item is a new item under our information calendar. Uh, as you recall, West Basin Municipal Water District staff did work on for some time a water cycling uh, master plan. As part of our presentation, we did bring that uh, to the Engineering Operations Committee, I believe on two occasions where we presented not just the overall presentation, but then did kind of a recap. As part of that effort, we plan to bring back periodically uh, specific issues within the, the water recycling master plan for kind of a deeper dive. And for that, we do have staff here for a presentation on one specific aspect of that, and that is the Hyperion Secondary Effluent Pump Station. Uh, for this presentation, we do have our Executive Manager of Engineering and Operations, Mr. Bar Kevin Serlin. We also have uh, our Engineer, engineer 3, uh, Mr. Kevin Cullen, as well as our consultant team from HDR. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Barkev. Thank you, EJ. And uh, uh, President Williams and, and board members, uh, the staff report I will be presenting today, as EJ mentioned, uh, can be found uh, on page 158 of the agenda package. Uh, the presentation itself uh, starts on page 162 of the agenda packet. Uh, and again, as, as um, uh, EJ mentioned, uh, today's presentation will provide a little bit of an overview of one of our most critical facilities, the Hyperion Secondary F1 Pump Station. But what we would like to do today is to discuss this facility within the context of our most recent master planning efforts, because it's not only important for us to know uh, what the facility does, uh, how it affects our recycled water program, but also to see how we could be utilizing this facility moving uh, into the future. So, um, uh, as you may as you may recall from previous meetings earlier this year, uh, both board meetings and engineering and operations committee meetings. Uh, we had a, a few opportunities to brief the board on our uh, most recent master planning efforts. Uh, why did we conduct the master plan? Uh, the last one that was conducted was in 2009. Uh, some of the projects that were recommended in that master plan were completed. Uh, some of the recycled water customers that we wanted to connect to, we connected to. Others, we determined that it was not feasible. Um, there has been a change in landscape uh, in the water reuse world. And so um, 10 years or so had passed and we thought it would be a good uh, idea for the district to conduct a fresh evaluation of our existing infrastructure, our treatment facilities, our distribution system, and uh, do a fresh market assessment of what, the, what potential opportunities are out there uh, if we were to expand our recycled water use in one way or another. Uh, and what we do is we take this uh, master plan, we, this master plan in particular was prepared with extra flexibility because of some of the factors uh, related to our source water, some of the factors related to the regional players that, that are developing their own recycled water program. So what we, we prepared this master plan, we conducted the evaluations, the assessments, and we prepared it in a way where we wanted to give the district and the board options um, of, of perhaps how to proceed. Um, and so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the options coming up, but what we do, what generally do is we take this master plan and we, we take some of its findings and uh, 
uh, which which is largely based on a, on, a, on a you know the master plan is largely a, a roadmap or a guide, if you will. We take some of those findings and we incorporate them into our five-year capital improvement program. The goals uh, of our capital improvement program is, is, as you can see from this slide, is to maximize recycled water production uh, and optimize our system and make it more reliable and to respond to uh, changes, regional changes, local changes, uh, uh, changes with, with, with laws um, and codes. Uh, and so what we wanna do today is talk about a particular facility, the Hyperion Secretary Effluent Pump Station. Uh, we ha do have projects in the capital improvement program to rehab uh, some section of, of the pump station. We're gonna talk about that. Uh, uh, so it's important for us to not only understand the facility itself and also look into it, um, look into the future. So uh, the Hyperion Secondary Effluent Pump Station, as you may know, is uh, is our entire recycled water system basically depends on its operation. Uh, you can see from this next slide that uh, the pump station itself, the the red uh, uh, rectangle, if you will, uh, on the slide is at the top of the pyramid. So we get a secondary effluent uh, treated sewage, if you will, from the city of Los Angeles's Hyperion Reclamation Plant. Uh, we use uh, that pump station, our pump station, to pump that water to the Edward C. Little uh, facility. Uh, and the, Ed, at the Edward C. Little facility, we, we have the four types of uh, recycled water that we produce, the, the water that we send to the barrier, uh, low pressure and high pressure boiler feed water that we send to Chevron, and then the Title 22 um, irrigation type of water that we send into the distribution system. From there, our satellite pla uh, plants pick up the Title 22 water and produce, um, uh, again, low pressure boiler feed water and nitrified water for cooling tower applications. So, you can see how the pump station uh, is, is such a critical element for the entire uh, recycled water system. Uh, so in this presentation today, we're gonna to talk a little bit uh, of the historical timeline and historical background on how we came about to build the pump station. Then I'm gonna pass it on to Kevin Cullen as, as EJ mentioned, and Kevin's gonna dive a little bit into the details of the pump station capacity. We're gonna go through some numbers, so excuse us if we get a little bit too detailed in uh, some slides. And then also at the end, Kevin's gonna hand it back to me to, to, uh, to see what does this all mean for us uh, moving forward. Uh, many of you have seen this slide before. Our recycled water program all started in response to a drought in the late 1980s early 1990s, and it all started with an agreement with the city of Los Angeles to purchase and treat that secondary effluent. Um, and that agreement was executed in 1991. We uh, secured uh, funding to build the facilities. The, the pump station itself, the original pumping facilities were built between 1992, 1993, but uh, the rest of our facilities uh, were completed the ECL facilities and a couple of satellite plants around 1995, uh, where we started to uh, deliver recycled water. Uh, 2000 to 2018, we had a series of expansion. We have five different phases at the Edward C. Little facility, five different expansion areas uh, within the facility uh, to, and uh, all of that uh, helped us reach the milestone of uh, producing 225 billion gallons of recycled water uh, over the course of the 26 years. Um, uh, in 2011, it's worth noting that we did have an amendment with the city of LA to expand the Hyperion uh, pump station. So let's talk about those agreements. In 1991, uh, we established that first agreement with the city of Los Angeles and the terms included how much we would pay for the secondary effluent, um, also, it looked at uh, the, the term of the agreement would be 25 years, automatically uh, extended uh, in five-year increments. 
uh, with no written notice of refusal issued within 24 months of expiration. Uh, initially, uh, the city of Los Angeles uh, envisioned using 25,000 acre feet of the recycled water that West Basin would, would uh, produce. Uh, later, uh, a few years later, when we, we did the amendment, that went down closer to um, 18,000 acre feet or 16 MGD. Uh, today, they're using about 10% of that, about 1,800 acre feet per year uh, of recycled water. In 2011, we did um, execute an amendment uh, because we realized that the pump station needed to be uh, expanded uh, to meet the different uh, expansion projects that we had and, and the additional demand that West Basin was committed to providing. Uh, so we executed an agreement, and as part of that agreement, uh, the thought was, okay, we would expand Hyperion Pump Station from 51 MGD to 70 MGD, and the city would retain ownership of the, the, the pump station property. Uh, they will still own the property, and we, what we would own is the pump station facilities themselves. And then if, if at some point the program ends, um, we would basically return the facility to the city, the, the, the property. With that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Kevin Cullen, our project manager, uh, who's worked on the pump station. And Kevin's going to go through some slides talking about the source water as well as uh, the, the capacity of the pump station. Kevin? Thank you, Barkev. Uh, good afternoon, board members. Um, so, to help understand how the West Basin pump station operates, uh, I think it's helpful to also, at a high level, understand. Um, the Hyperion Water Reclamation Plant as well. So we'll start with the aerial view on the upper left-hand corner. Um, you can see on the left-hand side of the image, uh, that's the northern half of the plant out there. Primary, uh, that's the primary treatment side, um, mostly comprised of digesters and, and bar screens. Um, on the right-hand side, you have uh, the secondary treatment process, um, mostly comprised of secondary effluent clarifiers as well as other ancillary treatment processes. So Hyperion uh, subdivides its secondary process um, into individual treatment trains. Uh, they refer to them as modules. Uh, the majority of the flow that West Basin receives through the Hyperion pump station is from uh, modules one and two, which you can see highlighted there in the red. Um, there are certain times um, with seasonal flows and peak demand at the pump station uh, that we do also receive flow from uh, those clarifiers, other clarifiers highlighted in the turquoise color being a 4B, 4A, 3B, and 3A. Next slide, please. Um, the source water is conveyed uh, from the Hyperion pump station to the Edward C. Little facility uh, through a 60-inch diameter reinforced uh, concrete main. Um, it is lined with a, a PVC liner uh, to help prevent corrosion, and the total length of the pipeline is 2.3, 2.93 miles. Excuse me. Uh, the routing of the forest main itself, um, it travels from the Hyperion pump station south on Vista del Mar, where it turns up Grand Avenue um, and travels through the heart of El Segundo. From there, it turns right on Sierra Street, back onto El Segundo Boulevard where it cuts through the corner of Chevron's plant, um, and then it crosses Sepulveda Boulevard and enters the Edward C. Little facility um, behind the golf course and into the rear of the facility. Next slide, please. Looking at some of the historical influent flows and flow patterns uh, from the Hyperion pump station to the Edward C. Little facility, um, when we look at 2010 to 2015, we averaged uh, 20 to 35 million gallons per day. Um, and then from 2016 to 2019, we averaged flows of about 25 to 45 million gallons per day. Um, the main reason for that increase was the completion of the phase five expansion uh, in 2014. Uh, just something to note there. And then additionally, on the right hand side, um, you see another colorful graph. Um, this graph shows the flows average uh, max month flows. Uh, for the years 2016, 2017, and 2018, uh, broken apart by season. Um, so you can see uh, West Basin's lowest time for demand 
is at the end of winter, early spring. Um, and then conversely, uh, peak demand occurs late summer, early fall in the August and September months. Next slide, please. Um, when we look at the flows today, the Hyperion pump station is pumping approximately 37 million gallons per day to the Edwards C. Little facility. The treatment plant has about a 90% efficacy rate for a treatment process. So the influent water being 37 million gallons per day uh, actually results in about 34 million gallons per day of recycled water, product water. Next slide, please. Let's dive into the facilities themselves. Um, the original pumping facility uh, built in 1993, as Barkev mentioned, is a reinforced concrete building. It's located in the very southwest corner of the Hyperion plant. And the facilities uh, for the original pumping station um, included an outdoor uh, electrical transformer and, and just this concrete building itself. The building is divided into two rooms. There's an electrical room that houses motor, motor control centers, VFDs, uh, other ancillary electrical equipment. The other room is the pumping house, which houses the four pumps. There are two 800 horsepower pumps, each capable of pumping 21 MGD, and two 500 horsepower constant speed pumps, uh, each capable of pumping 15 million gallons per day. When we look at the capacity um, from these original pumping facilities, uh, we, we like to speak in terms of a firm pumping capacity, which uh, leaves one pump on standby or out of service. Um, so the firm pumping capacity of the original pumping facilities is 51 MGD. And one caveat um, that that this pumping facility differs from the, the newer pumping facilities is that uh, the wet well, which each of the four pumps um, pull from and draw water out of, uh, is, is shared. So it's a common wet well, uh, where conversely with the newer pumping facilities, they each have their individual wet well, which provide some neat flexibilities for maintenance purposes. Next slide, please. Um, the R&R &R project for the original pumping facilities has been part of the capital improvement program and original master plan for a number of years. Um, however, as part of the recent master planning efforts uh, that Bark have referenced, uh, we did do uh, a pretty comprehensive assessment um, so the HDR team did a thorough review of the historical documentation for the facility. Um, they conducted a field condition assessment, and within that field condition assessment, identified the needed repairs. Uh, those included structural repairs, repairs to the pumps, motors, and mechanical seals, uh, repairs to the pipelines, valves, and appurtenances, as well as instrumentation, electrical, um, communications, and security. Um, furthermore, uh, the technical memorandum produced on the Hyperion pump station also provided recommendations for both the capital project and for day-to-day uh, -day maintenance activities. Next slide, please. So some of the capital recommendations that came out of the condition assessment, um, they recommended that we do replace the pump and motors. Um, these pumps and motors have been in operation for almost 24 hours a day, you know, seven days a week for the last 25 years. So they, they definitely have a number of hours on them. Um, we're also looking at replacing the header outside of the pump station, uh, the four discharge isolation valves that come off of each pump, the air and vacuum relief valves um, situated on that discharge header, um, as well as installing a 48 inch um, isolation valve um, so that we can completely isolate this pump station if it's desired as well as looking at ancillary uh, improvements like, like grading, uh, emergency eyewash, um, security cameras, and a meter vault. Looking at also uh, at some big, bigger electrical improvements, uh, main circuit breaker replacement, and motor control center as well. Next slide, please. Um, so as part of the previous master planning efforts, um, the need for the Hyperion Pump Station Improvements Project uh, was identified. Because the Hyperion Pump Station is the sole source of plot supply uh, for the entire recycled water program, the importance of having continuous pumping uh, capabilities is, is not, uh, I guess, not understated. Um, the, the need is there. So in order to rehab uh, the original pumping facilities, um, it was outlined that a new pumping 
facility would need to be constructed constructed to facilitate uh, the repair and replacement of the original facilities. Some of the challenges that the improvements project uh, also address for the facility is because we are the last uh, load on the overhead circuit from the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the site is subject to frequent power outages. Um, most of these power outages aren't very extended, maybe uh, 10 to 30 seconds. At times there has been extended outages, but uh, most of them are pretty short. And there also is some power quality issues, meaning uh, variable harmonics in the quality of the power. It's not, not as steady as we would like it at times. So through the Hyperion Pump Station Improvements Project, uh, we not only installed new pumping facilities with three new pumps, but we also installed uh, new electrical gear and a new emergency diesel generator. So this generator and automatic transfer switch that were installed are uh, very capable. Um, they can detect um, dips in the power quality or dips in the power themselves. Um, and they provide a closed transition, a, a seamless transferring of power from utility to generator power uh, to keep the pump station up and going and uh, flow continue to be provided to the Edwards Little Facility. Next slide, please. Just to highlight uh, the new pumping facilities themselves, as mentioned, we installed three new 800 horsepower pumps, uh, each capable of pumping 20 million gallons per day. And the firm pumping capacity um, for this station alone is 40 MGD. Um, you can see on the left-hand image um, a plan view of what the new pumping station looks like. You can see the individual force main where it connects to the existing uh, pump station force main and some uh, construction images there as well. Next slide, please. So when we look at the pump station, the Hyperion pump station as a whole, in terms of pumping capacity, um, we've outlined what each of the firm capacities are looking at the facilities uh, separately. Um, for the old pumping facilities, um, when we have three active pumps and one standby, there's a firm capacity of 51 MGD. Uh, similarly, for the new pumping facilities with two active pumps and one standby, there's a firm capacity of 40 million gallons per day. But when we look at the system as a whole, um, in terms of sheer pumping capacity, uh, there are seven pumps available. When we look at having six active and one standby, there is a, a, a total upper limit on a firm capacity of 110 million gallons per day. So one caveat to this number is there are other uh, capacity limitations. Um, so this number ultimately could be reached one day, but only if uh, we address some of our power constraints as well as uh, some improvements on the force main itself. Next slide, please. Um, before moving on and looking at the power capacity and force main, I did want to highlight the existing capacity of the current pump station um, and where we're at today. So the electrical capacity on site um, allows us for up to 2,600 horsepower of pumping. Um, when we use, when we look at using the larger 20 MGD pumps, uh, we can use three of those. That gets us up at 2,400 horsepower. Or conversely, we can use four pumps, um, factoring in some of the 500 horsepower pumps, um, and we can reach up to 70 MGD. In terms of uh, today's capacity and room for, for current near-term growth um, on the customer end, we do have that 60 MGD constraint um, on the power side. So the current max day demand is 50 MGD from the Edwards Little facility. That leaves us 10 MGD of excess capacity for max day conditions. When you take that and you divide it by the annual average factor um, and then multiply that by the effective effect, efficacy rate, excuse me, um, you end up with an estimated 6.5 MGD of recycled water demands that can be added um, to the recycled water program before power upgrades or force main improvements are required. Next slide, please. As mentioned, the, the force main uh, travels from Hyperion to the Edwards Little facility through El Segundo. It's approximately 2.93 miles, um, and along its alignment, there are multiple air vacuum relief valves as well as blow offs and other appurtenances. Um, so we'll jump into those next slide, please. Um, as mentioned, the force main does have some limitations in, in terms of surge capacities. Um, when 
pumping operations are interrupted or stopped due to any number of reasons, there's a pressure wave that travels through the pipeline, um, very commonly known in the water industry. And the pipeline must be uh, properly equipped um, with air vacuum relief valves and or surge tanks to relieve this pressure. So um, when we first looked at expanding the pump station facilities um, at the time in January 2004, a long time ago, we were looking at alternative pump station locations. Um, so that report recommended you know, additional vacuum relief valves and or a pressurized surge tank if we wanted to get up to 120 MGD one day. Um, we, we jumped into a detailed design following the heels of the original master plan um, that, that informed us we needed to expand the Hyperion pump station. And that detailed surge analysis uh, looked at maximizing the flow conditions of up to 111 MGD at the time. Um, and that recommended installing four new eight inch air vacuum and relief valves, as well as two new two inch valves. And then all of the existing ARVs, which at the time were only equipped with relief, meaning it could let air out of the pipeline. Um, all of the other ARVs were recommended to be equipped with a venting um, that allowed both air to exit the pipeline and come into the pipeline as well. So when we went to do construction and implement um, all of these recommended improvements, uh, we did run into a hang up with the city of El Segundo because our pipeline uh, is located on Grand Avenue and it's such a thoroughfare for the city of El Segundo, um, coupled with the fact that our pipeline is approximately 15 to 20 feet deep within the middle of Grand Avenue. Um, those improvements, mainly the, the eight inch ARV improvements uh, would have required two separate shutdowns, complete closures of Grand Avenue. Um, and while they would be limited windows, um, the timing of the project had them falling in the summer months um, and a business decision was meted that the for the near-term improvements and near-term demands, uh, those improvements could be delayed. So we had the uh, consultant perform a, a follow-on surge analysis, and the surge analysis focused on the near-term flows up to 60 MGD, um, and that report ultimately said uh, you can postpone the 8-inch installations, but all the other recommendations should be made, um, and, and those were completed as part of the improvements project. Next slide, please. So just to wrap up the conclusions of that final surge analysis report, um, vapor pressure is not predicted for any flows 50, 54, or 60 MGD, uh, but for uh, the district to expand the capacity beyond 60 MGD and up to 111 MGD, these four additional eight inch ARVs will need to be installed at some point in the future. Um, two of them are located on the hill going up to Grand Ave going to the crest of Grand Avenue. Um, the third is at Grand Avenue and Penn, uh, more or less in the heart of El Segundo. And then the fourth and final one is within the easement um, the district holds behind the uh, Lakes Golf Course. And with that, I will turn it back over to Barkev. Thanks, Kevin. So in addition to the surge constraints uh, that Kevin mentioned on the, on the force main that uh, Kind of limit the capacity of the force main at this time to 60 million gallons per day. Um, we also have to look at the hydraulics of, of, of the force main itself uh, in terms of velocity. Um, the master plan recommends that velocities ultimately don't exceed seven feet per second uh, to minimize uh, the wear and tear on the pipeline. Uh, so what that does is that the master plan goes into, well, if we were to stick with seven feet per second velocity in the future in that force main, uh, you're limited at, at 90 million gallons per day. Um, of course, if you go up to 110 to match what the potential capacity of the pump station is, you would get velocities higher than 7 feet per second, closer to 8.79 feet per second, which may be acceptable uh, for the pipeline, uh, for the pipeline's operation, given the fact that those peak conditions would, have, would probably just occur on the hottest day of, of, of the year. So let's try to summarize the capacity discussion. Um, what we have here on this slide is that uh, is a summary of the capacities for the pump station and the force main. So we got the, uh, the pump station up on top and the force main at the bottom. And what the orange boxes show up here is, is the existing conditions. 
the green boxes, potential future condition. If you look at the pump station at the first row up on top, the firm pumping capacity for the pump station today is around 60 million gallons per day. And the major co contributor to that is the power constraint. Uh, if we look at the existing conditions at the bottom for the force main, uh, with the surge constraints that we have on, on the force main itself, that too, the capacity of the force main as well, is around 60 million gallons per day. So what does that mean for us? If we take that 60 million gallons per day and we say that the pump station needs to be able to pump 60 million gallons per day on the hottest day uh, of the year, so we, we've factored that max day uh, demand in the equation. We can transfer that into an average day demand. And then we can run that through the efficiency of the treatment facility. We multiply it by the 90%. And so what that means is that the existing 60 million gallons per day of capacity on the pump station of the force main translates to a 40 to 45 MGD of product recycled water demand. So that's roughly 45,000 to 50,000 acre feet per year. Um, and so the, the reason why we give a range here um, between 40 and 45, because it really depends what demand you add to the system uh, has a uh, has a effect on the max day demand. So for example, if you're adding irrigation demands, those irrigation demands vary seasonally, as Kevin showed. Uh, so they could be higher in, in the summer, and we need to account for those. But if you're adding a demand, uh, like a, a, a barrier demand, uh, a demand of where you are just injecting the water into the ground, you can have a consistent demand and it's not impacted seasonally. So the maximum day demand to average demand, uh, you, you have a little bit more wiggle room there in the capacity. That's how. That's why we have a range there between 40 to 45 mgd of product water demand. So that's existing conditions. If we were to pick, okay, what could be the potential future conditions? We talked about how the firm capacity of the pump station, if all seven pumps are are refurbished and ready to go, we have 110 million gallons per day, and that's again assuming that we give it, uh, we provide the power that it needs on the potential future, future condition of the force main, uh, 90 MGD, but nearly 90 to 110 MGD, uh, if we allow for the velocities in the force main to exceed seven feet per second per period. So for the potential future, what does this capacity mean? The, the 90 to 110 MGD, it means an average day demand of product water ranging between 60 million gallons per day to 72 million gallons per day. So between what the existing capacity is today, and if we were to do all these improvements, surge protection, power, uh, rehab the, the pumping facilities, we could potentially go up to 110 MGD. So that's about 50 to 60% increase uh, on the product water demands in the future. So what this master plan did um, is it looked at well, what else is out there for West Basin or for West Basin's partners, the city of Los Angeles or, or Metropolitan, to each of us with our own recycled water programs in the future. We looked uh, for West Basin, we talked to uh, potential customers inside our service area, but also neighboring um, agencies as well. And we looked at uh, customers for Title 22 water, for nitrified, for all five different types of recycled water that we produce. But we wanted to see who else is out there that could potentially use this, including uh, barrier water and advanced water, uh, advanced treated water to put more into, into the ground. And what the master plan determined is that there's approximately 62 million gallons per day of additional demand out there um, in and around our service area. There's uh, about 2 million gallons per day for little connections for uh, folks that are uh, uh, 
uh, for sites that are really close to our existing uh, uh, purple pipes. Um, there's opportunities to expand with more pipelines. There's another 60 million gallons per day there. And then there's potentially about 20 million gallons per day approximately uh, of an opportunity to put more water into the ground through a new ground augmentation project, as well as potentially add another 10 MGD into the barrier system. Um, so that's what the market analysis indicated, but we don't necessarily have to, uh, we as West Basin have to uh, go after all of them. Um, uh, so what the master plan did is again, provide options, provide um, alternative paths to proceed, if you will, for, uh, for West Basin. And uh, uh, we talked in the past about the different options that our master plan provides, scenario A, B, and C. A had a, a bigger focus on more water going into the ground. Uh, B had more focus on expanding purple pipe with new pipelines and pump stations and reservoirs. And then C had uh, a, a bigger focus into sending advanced water treatment to industrial customers in the LA Long Beach area. Uh, each one of these uh, scenarios, A, B, and C, looked at uh, some phasing that we would go through over, over the next 20 years, potentially, if the source water is available. And we looked at uh, every five years uh, uh, between now and, and, and the next uh, phase two, the end of phase two would be uh, the end of 10 years would be 54 MGD demand. And then if we added more project, go up to 65 and then potentially up to 70. And what I'd like to do now is just go over one of the scenarios. And I just picked one just as an example. Um, and this, this one in particular is A, which focuses into putting more advanced treated recycled water into the ground. So this first column, you can see that what we have today is we're producing around 34 million gallons per day of product water on average. Um, Summertime higher, wintertime lower, but 34 on average and an annual average. And that's based on what we sent to Chevron, about four MGD. We sent to the barrier on average 12 in the last three years. And then we send to our Title 22 customers and our, our satellite plants around 18. That makes up the 34. So the next five years, if we were to um, send five MGD more to the barrier. Uh, the barrier is undergo uh, undergoing uh, rehab projects for their wells, their injection wells, and adding a few more wells. So if we uh, make add another five to the barrier system and then have uh, some of the projects that are pending completed, we're looking at a, an increase of about 10 MGD uh, to get us to 44, from 34 to 44. And then in the next five years, if we primarily add a, a 9 MGD uh, project where we could put more advanced treated water uh, uh, somewhere between the uh, Carson and Torrance area where WRD is looking to put uh, more water into the ground, uh, that will take us up to 54 MGD. And then if we did that again, if we had a second phase because WRD is, is, is looking at uh, securing 20,000 acre feet uh, of advanced treated water to put into the ground, to store into the ground. We could technically have a second phase for that and add another 9 MGD into the ground. And then potentially there has been studies that looked into that the barrier could be expanded as well. And another 5 MGD could come in in the future. So this is, this is mainly the, the groundwater augmentation type of focus uh, scenario. So what does this mean? If something like this were to happen, uh, in our existing capacity, what we have right now with the limitations on, on the force main and the limitations on the pump station, we could handle these flows uh, uh, for, that we have for the first uh, five years. If we were to uh, make the surge uh, improvements 
uh, and go up to 70 MGD, we could probably handle uh, the first phase of a groundwater augmentation project. If we were to add the power to the pump station and rehab all of the pumps and go up to somewhere between 90 to 110 MGD on the pump station and force main, we could technically go to a, a, a product water uh, delivery of 70 million gallons per day. So this is one scenario, one demand scenario, and you can see how the pump station and the force main play into potentially uh, implementing a scenario such as this one. And, and here again, you can see um, what, what's important for us in, in, in when we're looking into uh, rehabbing the facility, uh, the, the old pumping facilities, if you will, it's important for us to, to um, make decisions that are feasible for the district to see what exactly do we need uh, to refurbish at this time and when do the next phases come along. And so uh, this is where the calculation of what we have, what the capacity of the pump station is, we have to correlate that to an end demand and a potential project whether it's adding more water in, into the ground or whether it's expanding purple pipe, uh, that connection has to exist and that has to be evaluated, uh, particularly in our next phase of the r, &R project. That concludes our presentation. I'll be happy to open it up to um, questions by the board. Well, thank you very much, uh, Barkhead. I think um, I wanna toss first question or opportunity to uh, Director Alvarez. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have any uh, questions. Um, I appreciate the presentation and uh, the understanding that the uh, Hyperion uh, pump station has limited capacity and effectively is right now limited to about 60 MGD. Uh, so when we talk about the overall uh, capacity of treatment at the Etsy Little plant, we need to understand what all of the constraints are. One of the primary constraints is getting water there. And and today, um, the maximum amount of water we can get there is about 60 MGD. So I, I very much appreciate the overall overview of the uh, <clears throat> conditions uh, and the operation of the Hyperion pump station. I think it behooves us all to understand uh, where our limited capacity issues are. Um, we did invest quite a bit of money uh, when the district did the upgrades uh, that were completed, I think, 2018, plus or minus, uh, at the Hyperion pump station. So theoretically, you look at that, and it was 110 MGD, but that capacity is not truly there the way it's uh, functionally operational. Uh, anyone else care to comment? Director Deer? I think uh, the water industry is known for its planning ahead, and this is a good example. So excellent work. Thank you. Director Gray? Director Houston? Yeah, sure. This is um, Director Houston. No, I. All I really have to say is a comment at this point, and uh, thank you for this presentation and really letting us know where we're at on some of our um, capacity issues and, and the things that are going to impact this, uh, you know, increasing capacity and moving forward, et cetera. But I really do look forward to down the road when we're going to talk about these types of issues, um, you know, in our strategic planning or a more, uh, you know, formal way where we really can weigh in on it and give staff direction. So I think it's a good overview and uh, greatly appreciate this point. All right, thank you. Well, I just want to say that ditto. Thank you very much, outstanding. So uh, we look forward to uh, hearing more as we look ahead. We know that we have, a that there's gonna be challenges. And uh, what it sounds like we are we are we have the folks with us who are trained to meet the challenges so uh, thank you very much thank you. next item
Yes, thank you, President Williams. The next item we have, we're rolling now into item 10, our uh, receive and file calendar. And I will let you know that all of these items were heard in uh, policy committees uh, over the past month. Thank you. I would entertain a motion. I'll Please. move to receive and file. Second. All right, then moved and seconded to re receive and file. Uh, call the question, please. Roll we'll call. Yes, Director Alvarez. Yes. Director Deer. Yes. Director Gray. <laughs> Director Gray. Mm -hmm. Okay. Director Houston. Yes. President Williams. Yes. Okay. Motion carries. On to next item, which is uh, number 11, which is the general manager activity report. Yes. Thank you, President Williams. Uh, I did want to highlight uh, a few things. I'll try to move through it as quickly as possible. Uh, today, I did attend the uh, Cal DSAL Executive Committee board meeting. Uh, that uh, item was uh, fairly interesting. As I mentioned last time, uh, the current executive director, Wendy Ritterbush, has submitted her resignation. So they are now in the process of uh, reviewing applications for a potential new executive director. Uh, and they do have a selection panel uh, that is working on that. Uh, next, I wanted to highlight uh, that uh, late last week, uh, I did send uh, the board uh, a specific item related to a hydraulic fluid leak uh, at the Edward C. Little Water Recycling Facility. Uh, on Monday, October 18th, West Basin was notified of a complaint regarding an oil leak at the solids handling facility at the Edward C. Little Water Recycle Facility. The complaint was made to Cal EPA in claiming that le leaked oil from the filter press equipment is entering the recycled water system. While it is true that a repair is needed to fix a seal and stop a small leak of hydraulic fluid, the fluid has no pathway to entering the recycled water product as it is part of the solids handling system. Suez has been containing the leak fluid in a drum and pumping it back for reuse on the equipment while they determine an opportune time to make the necessary repairs. The repairs would necessitate a shutdown of one, or, one of only two critical solid dewatering units. Uh, the three-day shutdown would impact the district's uh, water recycling production capability. Uh, West Basin uh, provided a thorough report and clarification back to the regula uh, regulator uh, on Tuesday, October 19th, and we did schedule a site visit for the regulator to, uh, that was conducted just this past Friday on October 22nd. Uh, the site walk went well. The regulator came out to see the situation and understand exactly how the system isn't connected to product water and how it would be hard for the oil to reach the solids. Staff was directed to include a brief update on the next quarterly uh, compliance report, uh, and there was a team uh, uh, in attendance for this event, which did include uh, SUAS, West Basin staff, as well as the regular. Uh, the next item I want to highlight, uh, of course, is from just this past Saturday, uh, October 23rd, was our water harvest, the first ever uh, virtual event. Uh, while the attendance numbers have not been completely uh, identified, we do have, uh, we do know that there was a peak of 275 uh, people participating. Uh, we had uh, uh, roughly uh, 260 for the majority of the event. We did select two specific winners of our uh, raffles. And you, uh, I think you had the opportunity to see that uh, the winner of the electric bike was Avina Reyes from the city of Torrance. And the winner of the washer and dryer was Santiago Garcia from the city of Inglewood. Um, our very own team of Melissa Buendia, uh, Daryl Ramos-Young, and Janelle and Kyan were the broadcast uh, hosts. Of, they obviously come from our public information and education uh, team, but we also had a whole host of participants, including DWR, Metropolitan Water District, LA County Sanitation, and the Water Replenishment District. A video will be made available, and staff will report uh, with specific analysis on the attendees at the upcoming uh, December Public Information and Education Committee. Uh, the WEFTEC uh, conference was held just this past uh, week in Chicago, uh, October 16th through the 20th. Attendees included Director Alvarez, Director Houston, and Director Gray, who attended on behalf of Metropolitan Water District. Uh, they provided uh, numerous uh, opportunities to learn uh, more about the technical capabilities in potable reuse, 
stormwater, watershed management, uh, as well as the future of water use efficiency. Uh, the Southern California Water Coalition held its annual dinner. Uh, that event was held on Thursday, October 21st in Long Beach. Attendees included Director Alvarez, Director Gray on behalf of Metropolitan Water District, Mar Margaret Mogia, uh, Barkin Messerlin, Wendell Johnson, Uzi Daniel, Marianne Rexroad, Joel Blair, and myself. Uh, we also had a new staff member, uh, John Venner, uh, in attendance. Uh, at that event, uh, Senator Henry Stern did address the attendees, talking a little bit about the future of water within this drought and what we can all do to work together. Uh, they did also present their Harriet Weeder Award, who was presented to, or which was presented to uh, Ron Gastello, former general manager of Metropolitan Water District. And they handed out, uh, I think most of you know, they have a new award there, the Kathy Cole Award. Uh, named after a Metropolitan Water District's longstanding advocate, uh, and that was awarded to Irvine Ranch's Christine Compton. We have a handful of upcoming uh, board and committee meetings uh, throughout the month of November. We will have staff uh, email that out, uh, and we do have those events on your calendar. We also have an upcoming event with the Women in DSAL uh, that will be held on November 4th. Uh, it was originally scheduled to be uh, uh, held at the Edward C. Little Water Recycling Facility, but I believe due to COVID restrictions and uh, the requirement to show proof of vaccination uh, within LA County, the event has been moved outdoors to the Salt Creek Grill, which uh, is just right there in the city of El Segundo. We have a, a list of upcoming conferences. Uh, again, staff will email those out to the board of directors uh, for your consideration as to uh, which ones you wanted to participate in. We have a number of upcoming holidays, including the Veterans Day holiday on November 11th, Thanksgiving Day, uh, Thursday, November 25th. And of course, uh, the secondary holiday uh, on that Friday, uh, Friday, November 26th. And I did also wanna bring uh, to your attention uh, you might recall that in the month of December, uh, we sometimes have uh, not a conflict, but we look at a potential scheduling of our upcoming uh, committee and board meetings. And my understanding is the December board meeting was originally scheduled to be held on the 27th, which is right in between uh, the Christmas and New Year holiday. And we always want to bring this to your attention because if, of course, we, the board would like to move that. We'd like to make sure that we find a date uh, that would be timely to, to do. Uh, you'll recall that the Christmas holidays are celebrated on uh, December 23rd and 24th, and the New Year and New Year's Eve holidays are scheduled on the 30th and 31st. I don't know if the board has any direction or potential dates on that uh, as far as what they'd like to do, but obviously staff would take your direction at this time. My okay. preference is that we go dark for the month of December. I, I don't think they have on the 27th. Twenty-seven. Here. It should be noted as far as uh, going dark. Uh, if if it was the board's direction to do that, as we move our committee items through, uh, any sort of action item that's approved by committee would not be able to be authorized until the fourth Monday of uh, January. Yeah. That's not good. So, yeah. My understanding. Yeah. Is that a motion or what? Right. Well, it's a suggestion. I would do that. Um, Council, I don't know if an action uh, no, is required a, for a. Um, it wasn't scheduled uh, for going dark on the, on the um, yes. If the board wishes to change the adopted meeting schedule, it should be done by a motion by by an action of of the board. Yes, but it's not a uh, not an item for action. So we would add. Day. We need to add it to the agenda. Then it's not on the agenda. This, is, this has come up under director's com um, sorry general manager's comments and he's just asking for feedback so we're expressing our opinion 
Yeah, Perhaps if it's the direction of legal counsel, staff could take uh, their their direction. We could bring it forward for an action uh, at a special board meeting sometime in December with the expectation that we well, would change that schedule. Yeah, we, there's meetings in November. You can. Oh, correct, correct, yeah. correct. I apologize. Why don't you do that? Happy to do that. Is is there any specific direction? Not for me. Because I'll I'll do I'll meet. Let's let's face it. Wherever you are. Hello. So I did like it and bring it to the board. Will do. And that includes or concludes uh, my general manager's comments. Okay. Then that takes us to the next item, which would be uh, the uh, AB 1234 reporting compliance. I have nothing at this time. Uh, anyone else? What did I jump over? Oh, you know, so. Well, you guys always go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I'll be very brief. Thank you. President Williams and board members. Uh, I will um, have a summary of our um, matters, pending matters, uh, distribute to you via email since two of the directors aren't here. Uh, and if you have any questions on them individually, please feel free to call me or Stephen. Uh, we are working on a public records act request that came in from Transparent America, basically requesting uh, updated information on employee compensation. So we're working with staff on, uh, on getting that done. That'll be my report. Thank you. Okay, Director Houston. Uh, I have nothing. I'll put it in uh, writing. Thank you. Okay. No, I'll, re I'll report it on my uh, form. Thank you. Okay, then. That takes us to uh, closed session. And Thank you. President Williams, uh, the board will meet in closed session on one item, and that's a conference with legal counsel pertaining to general manager recruitment. Okay. Then we will recess to general, let me to closed session.
Hello. Okay, closed session has. Uh, I did. Okay, I just want to. Okay. Okay, we are now uh, reconvening the board meeting and returning from from closed session and there's no reportable action. Thank you. Therefore, therefore this meeting is adjourned. Director's comments. Yes, 15. I apologize. So the next item that we have is item number 15, director's comments and future agenda items. Okay, I thought we had done that. <laughs> but I guess that, that was on uh, maybe. Ditto. No. Okay. All right. No comments. No comments. I, I, will, uh, I do have a couple of comments. One, I just. Uh, <clears throat> Director Alvarez, if you could turn on your microphone. Am I on now? Yes. I even took off my mask, so I'm understandable. Uh, AJ earlier mentioned that we attended the uh, Water Environment Federation annual conference. I thought it was a fairly uh, well presented conference. The um, subject matter at multiple sessions was very good. It covered water, wastewater, stormwater, entire field. Uh, so that was uh, heartening to see. Uh, I attended several sessions. I focused primarily on uh, <clears throat> water reclamation types of projects. Uh, and there was uh, some good sessions on uh, indirect and direct portable reuse. Um, city of El Paso, for example, is moving forward now with a direct portable reuse uh, project where the, the water is basically coming from a treatment plant, very similar to what we do, but going straight into their distribution system. Um, so direct portable reuse yeah. is being done uh, at multiple locations. I just cite that as one example. Okay. There was also an interesting uh, presentation on the water replenishment district's uh, indirect portable, re, uh, portable reuse plant in Pico Rivera and how that plant uh, is designed and built to a 27 MGD capacity, although it operates at 10 MGD. Um, and uh, there were quite a few sessions also on stormwater and the uh, potential uh, benefits of uh, better managing our stormwater systems. Um, I think that's an expensive uh, way to go, but it does offer some opportunities, and uh, that is something that's uh, <clears throat> now uh, gaining some strong uh, footing in Los Angeles. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that uh, pursues. But they, they gave examples of uh, various projects uh, some of the constraints as well as some of the opportunities that was offered by doing that. Overall, I thought it was very good. Uh, I also want to talk about a little bit about the drought. Uh, the governor has uh, <clears throat> basically, again, reiterated that uh, we're looking for a 15% reduction. I don't think we're seeing those kinds of numbers in Southern California. So maybe we can put this on the agenda for a future board meeting. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we look at is there has been uh, quite a bit of conservation in terms of uh, per capita water usage in within the uh, West Basin uh, service area. I think we're down in 120 gallon per capita day, uh, <clears throat> if I uh, recall the numbers correctly. Um, a lot of that is uh, not the uh, interior household use. I think that that per capita day consumption is quite below that, but the reason for being that high 
is uh, a lot of the uh, landscape uh, water demand and that uh, we ought to start looking at opportunities for really uh, curtailing back in some of that I know that we've talked about and we do have an active program right now for turf replacement uh, but at some point um, we're going to need to continue to expand that as that's the that's the biggest single thing we can do to really reduce overall uh, de demand for uh, for water. Um, so I'd like to see that come back to us, at least a report of where we are and uh, opportunities for increasing that and how we're going to be better at, uh, able to meet the uh, governor's request for 15% reduction in water consumption. That's it for my comments. Okay, I'd like to piggyback on, on those comments. And I, I would like to see that come back at our uh, engineering and operation uh, committee first and really uh, talk about this in, in, in great detail because I think maybe we should have a water conservation uh, subcommittee or uh, committee. And President Williams, for clarification, typically we do our water use efficiency or uh, monthly conservation update at our public information education committee. That's fine. Okay. Wherever, where, where, where to fit it in is your job. Will do. And uh, Mr. President, this is Director Houston. Yes. Um, I was able to get back on the the call, the meeting, and I just wanted to say, because I heard Director Alvarez talking about uh, West Tech, which I think West Tech was an excellent conference this year, much smaller than normal, but um, there were two sessions I sat in that I think were really good, but one was purely on resilience and resiliency, and it was really interesting uh, discussion um and the different presenters uh as a matter of fact one of the guys was a sustainability manager from the city of houston who works for the mayor of houston and talked all about the issues and challenges that houston has been facing in just even the last 12 months let alone long term um and another gal was talking about the work they're doing out in uh, miami and in tampa you know the issues that are going on with uh flooding and subsidence and, you know, uh, ocean level rise out in Florida. Anyway, it was a great conversation with all these uh, mostly engineers in the room um, talking about resiliency and how the water sector is looking at that going forward. And I, I know I've mentioned it to our general manager, and I think I might have even mentioned it at one of our last meetings, but I think that's something that we at West Basin also really need to take a look at with our own infrastructure and our own long-term planning. So when the time's right, I really would like to see that be a part of our discussion on the types of projects that we're looking at moving forward at the district. Um, and then the other session, which was excellent, because they started this a handful of years ago, but they do have a session for elected officials and appointed officials, and I was able to uh, sit in there and uh, met a number of really interesting folks. Uh, most of them are elected, but for example, you know, some of them were from Atlanta on the uh, the water district board that deals with uh, the water issues in Atlanta. A couple of really uh, interesting gentlemen, uh, a gal from South Carolina who's on a water board, um, you know, with a public works uh, person from, uh, I think it was Sunnyvale. Um, there was just a number of interesting folks, and so we got to talk and share our stories, and um, it was good for us as the, more of the policymakers um, to get to meet each other. So again, WebSec I thought was was really good. I learned a lot, um, but these are really great things that, uh, like Director Alvarez mentioned, that we can bring back, and I think we need to look at how we implement that information uh, here at West Basin. So um, with that, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, thank you. See anyone else? Director Gray, I received a call from her, but it didn't go through. So and I didn't. I didn't know she was. She was trying to to log on or what. Anyway, but I have nothing more. Uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, President.